So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you, um, Larry, for that introduction. Also wanted to thank um, Joe and the folks at the center for the invitation. And also thank um, Judith. I met Judith, I think it was about five years ago at the American Literature Association. And uh, Judith was one of maybe two people <laughs> at this session. It was a Sunday morning, 8 a.m. session or 9 a.m. session um, when I was presenting on some of my research on Fran Ross. Um, and I'm really grateful for uh, the encouragement and the feedback then as I was, it sort of helped me sort of power through um, and finish that project and well, finish that iteration of the project as I uh, progress with my um, research. Um, so happy to be here. So I actually am gonna begin uh, sharing screen because I want you to take a look at uh, Arabelle Thompson. And let's go here. So, um, present. So this is uh, Arabelle Thompson in uh, 1957, right? Um, she's uh, either 51 or 52, depending. I'm not sure what the what month it was. Um, and you see her uh, posing in the prison stripes. And then there's the sort of uh, joke there that EBT slept here too. And the significance of this uh, photograph is um, manifold. Um, I'll mention a few reasons why. First, this was my introduction to Arabelle Thompson. Uh, I was a fellow at the Vivian G. Harsh uh, Research Collection um, in Chicago in 2019. And I had gone there to do some research on uh, Alice Browning, who some of you may know, um, who was the editor of Negro Story, um, a publication in the 1940s. And she solicited, along with Fern Gaden, her um, co-editor and co-founder of the publication, she would often solicit uh, humorous contributions to this collection. And I was interested in her editorial vision. I was also taking a look at some of the humorous verse of Elma Stuckey, right, um, uh, who is sort of maybe best known for being the mother of, uh, of Sterling Stuckey. But Elma Stuckey was also responsible for some humorous verse in the 70s. I was not aware. Right, so summer of 2019, I was not aware of Arabelle Thompson. Um, but I was a fellow for the summer. I had access to the archives. About a week into my research, uh, one of the archivists came into the reading room, checked in and asked me how things were going. While there was some productive material related to my study of these two other figures, um, there was also a lot of material that wasn't proving fruitful. Um, it might've been stuff that was useful information or insights that'd be useful for my teaching, but not for the book, my book project. So uh, Beverly Cook, the senior archivist at Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection, offered to let me take a look at the Arabelle uh, Thompson papers. The papers were actually outside of, were not available to researchers at the time because they were being recataloged, right? So they were off limits, but because it's so related to my research, uh, the archivist uh, agreed to let me take a look at two boxes. Now, this collection is 99 linear feet. So I only took a look at a very, very small portion of that. But the first thing that Beverly Cook, the archivist, brought to me was this photograph, right? So this was my introduction to Arabelle Thompson. And it does address this, these issues of um, uh, confinement, constrainment of imagination that I think uh, my comments on Arabelle Thompson's uh, American Daughter address today, but also speak to larger concerns when it comes to Black women humorous um, and how their imaginations are often uh, constrained in their reading by a larger populace, right? And I'm going to actually stop sharing now and then I'll return to some uh, some images in a, in a moment. Arabelle Thompson wrote, it has been a lot of fun, this business of being colored, in her 1944 letter of application for the Newberry Library Fellowship. Writing to library director John Pargellis, she proposed a book project about an assortment of, quote, humorous incidents, end quote, of not just her family, but, quote, any Negro family. She expressed a desire to air the experiences of a black person who did not conform to dominant constructions of black identity with humor front and center. I want to make people laugh a little, she wrote. 
Her letter of application was successful, resulting in the 1946 publication of her first memoir, American Daughter, Africa, Land of My Fathers, um, which chronicles her travels in the continent, was, uh, came out uh, about 15 years later. Now, American Daughter was not a title she chose. Her working title was, I Found It Fun. And the distance between the two titles exemplifies tensions in its creation and threads in its critical reception. It also gestures at the memoir's relative, relative obscurity since. In writing through Jane Crow, Aisha Hardison details the comments of an exasperated editor in the margins of the American Daughter manuscript. The editor wrote, what are you setting out to do? A, write a series of humorous incidents about your life. B, prove a point. Thompson's response is not registered on the manuscript, but Pargelis offered his take in a marginal notation from the same day. He replied, quote, she is going to show by her life story the only way to solve the race problem, end quote. The directives and objections of Thompson's fellowship administrator and book editor reflect a wider unwillingness to recognize and a refusal to value meaning making in Black women's practices of humor that scholars like Daryl Cumber Dance, Carol Allen, and Dovanna Fulton, among others, have exposed and sought to remedy. Today, I'll concentrate attention on how Thompson writes inside of these directives while remaining faithful to her project. Like many other Black women creatives working against the bounds of tradition that impede apprehensions of Black women's experiences and Black women's creativity, Thompson offers instructions in how to read this collection of humorous incidents in the memoir's opening paragraphs. This reading practice is distinguished from the reading comprehension skills formal elementary education provides as she writes in American Daughter's first chapter that she flunked kindergarten. To this admission, she appends a caveat. It seems, quote, the curriculum wasn't difficult, end quote. Her failure then is not charged intellectual deficiency or indolence, but an appreciation of other wise and other ways of apprehending the world in thought and language. Thompson's efforts to instruct her readership find parallels in the practices of Jackie Mabley. Operating in an American, American comedic tradition girded in misrepresentations of Black womanhood, she taught her audiences how to read against the grain. A hallmark of Mabley's act, as many of you well know, was the rewriting of nursery rhymes. Mabley would preface the recurring bit by characterizing nursery rhymes as lies intended to perpetuate the power relations of the quote, good old days, a frequent target of her humor. And this would be great to hear uh, Mabley, but the clip that I had edited of this is not on this current device. So I'm going to read it and it's not going to sound as good, but nevertheless, you'll hear what Mabley would say. And some of you are probably familiar with this. You teach them that Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her dog a bone. I say that Mother Hubbard had her gin in the cupboard. You tell them Jack and Jill went up the hill for some water. I tell them that water don't run uphill. You tell them that the wolf ate up Red Riding Hood's grandmother. I tell him that if he did, then he must have used a tenderizer on her as tough as grandmother was. That wolf would have had a hard time. Mabley's first revision reveals the nursery rhyme as an instrument of indoctrination to feminine propriety. Her second revision calls into question the natural order that nursery rhymes instill. Her third revision worries dominant narratives of history. The grandmother, who could possibly be a stand-in for Mabley, succumbs to the wolf's attack, but not without a fight. That Mother Hubbard, Mother Hubbard is a comic nursery rhyme is not incidental. Mabley's revision suggests a critique of the American community tradition and American society. Toni Morrison similarly vitiates the children's primer in The Bluest Eye to critique an American literary tradition. See Jane, she has a red dress. She wants to play, who will play with Jane, becomes a series of letters. Both Mabley and Morrison reconfigure resources that introduce order and narrative to inaugurate imagination and legibility as a means to not only reorient audience members or readers, but also point to new possibilities for future Black women artists confronting, quote, 
the limits of black female representation, end quote, um, to invoke Carol Allen's critical engagement of black women humorous shaking that thing and all its wonders African-American female comedy, which of course appeared in studies in American humor. Arabelle Thompson's efforts to introduce order and narrative in service of inaugurating imagination and legibility occur in the first chapter of American Daughter. My Lord, it's a girl, are its opening lines. They are in the imagined voice of Thompson's father, a Virginia born chef who for the bulk of Thompson's youth worked a rock strewn stretch of rented North Dakota farmland. Thompson references her parents having previously welcomed a baby girl who did not survive. But Thompson does not source her parents' caution and concern in the threat of infant mortality. She describes her infant complexion as having been disturbingly pale, like that of her older sister. While her older sister did not live to take on color, Thompson did, as many Black babies do, to the great relief of her parents, she writes. So when they told him he was again the father of a girl, he began to worry. He needn't have. When I lost the newborn pallor, I began taking on racial traits so quickly and decidedly that mother became alarmed. She concludes this account of her entrance into the world with this sentence long paragraph. Colored storks are notoriously inconsistent. It would be ludicrous to think that a black girl having light complexion, a trait that accords black people, black girls and women especially, privilege under white supremacy, was the central concern of an African-American couple in 1905. By portraying her newborn pallor as a problem, Thompson recalls the sexual violence of conquest and enslavement, a cause of the notorious inconsistencies of colored storks with respect to physical features. Thompson's delayed display of racial traits also recalls ideological justifications of conquest and enslavement and the refutations they demanded. Categorizing black people as outside of humanity was essential to the development of a world named new in audacity and avarice. Through autobiography, often mediated through uh, an amenuensis, I always say that word incorrectly, black people have been compelled to prove their humanity and assert their freedom. She does not just quickly dispense with the question of whether she would develop the racial traits to fulfill the charge and acknowledgement of skepticism at her ability to tell a black story, or as Newberry Library Director John Pargelis put it, solve the race problem. She divests the question of its power by punctuating her origin story with a reference to a black cast Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Preoccupations with authenticity and uplift register as consequences of the nation's foundational myth. Thompson's quip establishes the account of her birth as a legend for reading her memoir. It renders that opening exclamation, my lord, it's a girl, as contemplation by father and reader of whether this American daughter could meaningfully represent blackness. American Daughter chronicles Thompson's family's move to North Dakota from Iowa, her college years in both states and her eventual, eventual move to Chicago where she held a series of odd jobs before securing work with the Works Projects Project Administration. Arriving just a year after the publication of Richard Wright's wildly successful autobiography, Black Boy, American Daughter was frequently compared to it. Ralph Ellison's review in the Saturday Review of Literature is illustrative of the concerns about Thompson's suitability to tell a Black story that the opening paragraphs of her mem memoir bring forward and break apart. Since this is a little bit long, I'm actually going to go back to share screen so you can follow along. Oops, no, that's not what I want to do. That's not the share that I want. Um, where's the share? Oh no, you can see it, present. Okay. Ellison's review reads, for all its friendliness and optimism, American Daughter is not nearly so worthy a book as Black Boy or No Day of Triumph, despite their questioning pessimism. For while these autobiographies are probing and serious, Miss Thompson's is humorous and superficial. Where they are deeply felt and passionate, she is strangely lacking in genuine emotion. There is such a contrast between Miss Thompson's obvious intelligence and her book 
that it, it is as though she had held back the better, more thoughtful part of herself. For although the work of a college major in journalism and the social sciences, American daughter is amazingly lacking in political, sociological, economic, or psychological insights. Thompson's use of humor is central to Ellison's criticism. He cleaves it to superficiality and fix it, fixes it as an impediment to the weighty insights he locates in the autobiographies of Wright and Jay Saunders Redding. He even accuses her of betraying her training in journalism. Although Thompson had not yet joined the John H. Johnson family of publications as a writer and editor, she had been a staff member of her high school and college papers and a contributor to the Chicago Defender. While gender and geography certainly account for the disparity in the critical receptions of Wright and Redding compared to Thompson, they were black men writing out of Southern experience and she was a black woman writing about coming of age in North Dakota. Ellison's grievance is about her mode of expressivity and its ability to do the heavy lifting regimen black writing is subject to. As Joanne Braxton's work demonstrates, Ellison misreads American Daughter. Despite his dexterity with humor as mode and theme, Ellison does not apprehend Thompson's uses of it. Braxton writes, the focus on gender and the use of humor and fiction in this unique autobi autobiography offer a positive and much more effective technique in relating the black female perspective during a time when any kind of valuable black perspective was only seen as nihilistic black male rage, bitterness and anger at a white supremacist racial order as represented in Richard Wright's Black Boy. Braxton recognizes humor as key to animating Black women's perspective and to dissolving notions of what a valuable Black perspective is. Arabelle Thompson was interviewed, was interviewed for, the Radcliffe, for Radcliffe College's Black Women's Oral History Project in 1978. The interview is a productive companion to her first memoir. Subject to extreme isolation on the basis of there not being many black people in the various cities that she lived, which included Driscoll, North, uh, North Dakota and uh, Mandan, North Dakota, and underestimation of her skill sets, but also projections and overestimations of who she was on the basis of race, she attested to developing a coping and creative strategy to manage all this. She told interviewer Marsha Greenlee, it got to the point where they just assumed I could do anything. And this is of her uh, classmates and companions. I couldn't really. So you become a legend. You put more effort in your work. You accomplish more. I share this in wrapping up because it speaks to the investments and privations of black womanhood that Hortense Spiller diagrams that preclude apprehensions of black women's experiences but also conjures the strategies that Thompson adopts in the memoir's opening pages to create a legend in the interpretive sense to exceed the limits of other imaginations and exercise the possibilities of her own. In my book project, Capacity for Laughter, Black Women in the American Commute Tradition, I pursue Black women's uses of humor as a critical but overlooked mode of Black feminist thought. Like the joyful noise of Black Pentecostal aesthetic performance a Sean Crawley hears as critique of an exploitative world, I observe how Black women have used humor to, quote, manifest resistance that exists before and against the power of aversion, end quote. Drawing on a vast, underengaged, and frequently unrecognized archive of Black women's practices of humor, I convene the concerns of Black feminist thought and indicate how these concerns intersect and have long been enacted through the mode of humor. Toni Cade Mabara once remarked that her work's tremendous capacity for laughter was overlooked, an observation that sources my book project's title, but also helps to contextualize Thompson's efforts to instruct her readership. The paucity of scholarly and popular engagement of the work of Black women humorists specifically reflects both the social construction of humor as a masculine practice and, and the contemptuous conceptions of Black womanhood that characterize the American community tradition. Both causes are sourced in an unwillingness to see Black women. And as Black feminist thinkers have worked to render Black womanhood visible and legible, they have frequently and strategically employed humor to achieve these aims. 
Just as a, a final note, if I have a moment, do I have a moment or two to show a few slides of some of some more of Arabelle Thompson's work or am I at my time? Or if, I, if I'm, I can't hear you, I think you're muted. We are, yeah, you've got a minute or two. Okay, I'll, I'll, 60 seconds. <laughs> so just so that you can see more, I know that um, um, I wanted to make this a more visual, but um, my analysis was more on the, the text. I'll just share screen briefly so that you have a better idea of the breadth of her work since I just focused on, oh, I was gonna show you these, but I decided, they, so I, the letter that I quoted at the beginning, there it is. But I wanted to sh show you some of, um, so this is a clip from, from the Chicago Defender. And uh, there was a column Lights and Shadows um, from the, uh, in the Chicago Defender that ran in the 20s and 30s. And it had a variety of contributors. Uh, Arabelle Thompson was a contributor and she was a contributor under the pseudonym Dakota Dick and sometimes Darling Dakota Dick. What's interesting about this um, humorous uh, piece, right, is she's writing in the style of her, um, of this character that she's assumed. And of course, many people who would contribute to this column, which was actually a poetry, um, a poetry uh, column, would assume these identities. But what's critical is at the end of the column, after she makes efforts to sort of organize a conference of all the contributors, at the end, she says, never mind this book of humor, let poetry, let's have a humor magazine, right? So, oh, why is this frozen, right? So you see also this deep investment in humor as a mode of expressivity, which also helps frame this pushback she's getting from her editors at um, University of Chicago Press, also uh, the Newberry Library director who are all sort of trying to steer her away from humor. But this was actually, in, when she's contributing to the Chicago Defender, she's a teenager. This, this is her late teens, right? We also see when you see, um, this is from 1922, she's 17 years old. She um, is writing and creating her own humor newsletter, right? So when you, when you think about her sustained interest in using this as her preferred expressive mode, um, now, it's hard to read, but she says, um, this is just a comment about SNAP in American Daughter, where she um, says that her, her fellow students allowed for her to have this corner of um, the newspaper, SNAP. And this is her humor publication that she's circulating at the time. And just, and you can see this from 1922. And then the last thing that I'll show, just an, an idea of the sort of range of her investments in humor writing before she gets to American Daughter are, um, this is from the Dakota Daily Student where she was a student. She ended up graduating from Morningside College, but um, she attended University of North Dakota. And so this is one thing that she contributed. Dear sir, I have three dates tonight with three different boys at all the same time. I love them all too well to turn anyone down for the other. How can I avoid them? Despair, answer. Benzene, strychnine, rat poison, and dynamite are all said to be good removing agents. This is an example of sort of humor that she's uh, trading in. So you get a sort of a larger portrait outside of the sort of focused um, uh, that I had in, uh, in my comments. But all that to say, there's this, there was this pressure exerted on her to shift her mode of expressivity when this was a mode that she had identified as one, the one that she wanted to animate her life's work. And so there is this, this constant tension that she's working with. And one of her strategies was to teach people how to read her and to be able to um, be able to uh, be able to, ex to receive and understand the sort of meaning making that she was attempting to get across through her uses of humor. So I appreciate your, your time and patience. Thank you.